Bitcoin is a political statement. Bitcoin is free speech. It's free speech. It's political yeah. speech. It is, a, it is, it's an object lesson in what you can and can't do with the currency and what works. I mean, if the if US dollar had kept the faith, there would be no Bitcoin. Bitcoin emerged because the US dollar did not keep the faith with its implicit promise that it would not inflate too quickly. Your crypto working for you, it can be with yield farming. But what are the risks? Hacking, volatility, poor smart contracts, scams. Even if you overcome the risks, there are still limitations. Do you have a million dollars to invest? Yield farming is a very complex, time-consuming, and expensive process. Can you imagine that not only you need to possess advanced skills to mitigate your risk and check smart contracts, but also you need to quit your job? In order to get the highest return, you need to manage thousands of platforms and check protocols around the clock. Well, not anymore. We are proud to announce the SwissBorg Smart Yield account. It's now possible for anyone to earn yield on most of your cryptos, such as USDC, Bitcoin, Ether, BNB, and only starting with 10 euros, the tap of your finger. So how does it work? It's simple. On a daily basis, Oracle scans and monitors all the different investment opportunities and delivers for you the best investment returns. So how is that more secure? Not only do we assess the best risk reward ratio, but also your assets are protected by our MPC technology and our safety net program. And how it does deliver return? Well, because our system is scanning the market every single day, you get the optimal return on that day. How do you get started? It's easy in three different steps. The first one, you deposit. The second one, you start the yield program. And the third one, you start relaxing, enjoying your passive income. So guys, you know what to do. Subscribe to the Smart Yields, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no OBS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, Gordon Einstein, founder of Crypto Law Partners. It's a pleasure to have you today, buddy. And before we kick off, a big shout out to Crypto Slate for always giving us awesome summarized articles of these interviews. So don't forget to check them out. And without further ado, Gordon, thank you so much for coming thank on the you. show, oh, buddy. We're, are we doing the, yeah. the COVID handshake? Okay, very good. You know, there's a version with the elbow. Oh yeah, we should do the elbow no, as but well. I, I, think, I think you know well enough. I, I know you well enough. I can do the, I can <laughs> it's all good. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for coming on the show, bringing so much energy here at the DeFi Congress. Yes. You're such a, an amazing person and you shared so much valuable information at the conferences and all the dinners we had. But to kick off, I'd love to hear about your story, Gordon. I know that you're someone who is a crypto attorney or you were an attorney and working in the law field, all of a sudden decided to leave, but something brought you back, something magical. Yes. If you don't mind sharing that story with us. The, the white hole of blockchain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I, I had practiced law doing state planning, tax and business transactions for I'm older than I look, for a solid 10 years. And then I got sick of it. And, well not sick of it, I kind of found it distasteful and I'll go into some details. So I left that, embraced my inner nerd, taught myself how to program and started a cloud computing company for law firms. And that company is still running today. It's called Adaptive Sky. It's a whole remote desktop solution for law firms. So that's, that's been my baby for a while. Uh, but then through a random, totally random sequence of events, I met uh, Pavel Kravchenko who I think you're going to interview also from Distributed Lab. I met him in 2014 in New York. Um, and this was, if you recall, when Ukraine was in the middle of an uh, active conflict. But he, in his generosity, invited me to Ukraine right in the middle of the war, which I thought was cool. Uh, I hadn't left the United States other than Mexico for 25 years. I'm like, sure. It's not like they're going to like invade the whole country, right? So I went out there. I went to Odessa. And Pavel and his people formed a big blockchain conference around me to make sure I was comfortable when I was there to have lots of friends. Because, you know, here's this crazy American who is going like, to come to Ukraine in the middle of a war after not having left the country for 25 years. Um, I got exposed to blockchain and Bitcoin. It took me a couple times hearing about it because it wasn't like in my alley to kind of get it. But once I got it, I, I had two twin epiphanies. Uh, the first one was that this area of blockchain and Bitcoin, it needs law. Like there was a wild west period, 
but as this grew in power and sophistication and engagement in the real world, it would need to have an understanding of securities law and corporate governance and employment and intellectual property, like all that kind of stuff. That's like what I call the layer one epiphany or the first realization. But I think my layer two was far deeper and far more meaningful, which is I realized it's not just that this stuff needs law, it's that law needs Bitcoin and blockchain, or rather law needs crypto and blockchain. In other words, all the things I had found distasteful, inefficient, stupid, annoying, and expensive about law were, and part of the reason why I had left the practice of law, were potentially addressable through this revolution, this technology and approach revolution, this idea of decentralization, this idea of spreading out power. And mm -hmm. I realized that there was a chance to reform everything about law that I found that doesn't work. And once I realized that, like the first time I was like, oh, there's an opportunity here if I want to like, you know, you know, have these guys like set up companies and stuff. I was like, okay, that's interesting. But the moment I realized maybe you don't need a company anymore. Maybe you don't need a contract in the traditional sense anymore. Maybe you don't need tax specialists anymore. Maybe there's a whole other way of doing all this on a global basis. Then I was like, oh my God, I need to get back into law and fix it using blockchain. And that was, I, I had my complete revolution in like 2015, 2016. So I don't know if I'm an OG Bitcoiner, but I'm, not, I'm an OG crypto attorney. So proud to say, um, and it's just kind of morphed since then. And you know, we'll we'll talk about it. I, the practice has grown. I speak around the world. You know, here we are in beautiful Dubai, but that's that's the origin tale. That is a really cool origin tale. And and I must yeah. say, so you kind of saw it not just in one way. You saw the best of both worlds. That way, what you were saying is like they both need each other in order to succeed and create this global law or or right. utopian view of. That's a good question. So there's this whole Hegelian notion of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Like, you know, the things come together and they form something new that's not just a blend. You're not just averaging it out, but you have a new idea, you have the new step in evolution. I mean, the traditional forms of law that we've had, whether it's company law or contract law, commercial, whatever, they've evolved over hundreds, if not thousands of years. And, they're, you know, they, they make sense on, when to understand their history and what we're dealing with, they make sense in their own way. They're not completely random. It's not like a bunch of, you know, monkeys typing out Shakespeare. There's a logic to it. But that logic is incomplete and fractured given the fact that these things are largely historical artifacts and the fact we're dealing with this multi-jurisdictional world. So, but they do have things to offer to blockchain and Bitcoin, or crypto rather. They do have ideas and I'm porting those ideas over all the time. Um, like, you know, how do you, what elements of company law apply to DAOs, for example? It's an open question and one that I'm working on actively. But yeah, and then it's a blend backwards. So you're just like, you know, this old version of law needs to go. And I'll, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Uh, and this is very specific to me as an attorney from the United States. But there's no such thing as the United States company. There's a California company. There's a Nevada company. Actually, LLC. There's a New York or Delaware company. But there's no such thing as a US company. And we have 50 different versions of company law. And we have 50, 49 different versions of money transmitter law. And even if you go to the European Union, you have a, you know, a French company and a German company and a Polish company and you know, and you have different kinds of within there. You have like Acting Gesellschaft and GmbH if you're like in Germany. It is insane. And people spend so much time and so much effort figuring out which jurisdiction are they gonna set up in, what kind of entity, how are they gonna plan their taxes, how are they gonna plan their structures, you know, the intellectual property royalties go there, but you know, the licensing goes there, but you know, all this kind of junk. It is a waste of human energy to do all this. Yeah. And if I can just share a little anecdote I like to share. Yeah, please. So I, you know, I, I can, the way I look at myself is like, I'm not old, I'm not young. I'm kind of like middle zone. Maybe I'm being flattering to myself. <laughs> but when I was born, you know, I was a big science fiction fan. And I read The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. I saw, you know, 2001 Space Odyssey, read the book. Uh, Blade Runner, you know, is my favorite Runner. film. Yeah. And one thing I realized is that all those movies, you know, here we are in 2021. All those movies are set in our past. Now. They weren't before, but now every single movie, I mean, all those books and all those movies I like, they're now our past. But we're not on Mars, Elon Musk notwithstanding. We don't have flying cars. I mean, our background should have flying cars in it right now. That'd be cool, but I don't see any flying cars. You know, we're just beginning to kind of head into drones. You know, we're not living to 120. We don't have colonies on, moon, on the moon, you know, all this stuff. And so, the, I mean, in the original sense of the word, humanity has, our development has been retarded. Okay, you know, people think that's a bad word now, but the technical meaning yeah, is slow. Yeah, slowed, yeah. Okay, exactly. and our development has been retarded. Well, part of what's retarding the growth and progress of humanity is this illogical diversity, in, this wasteful diversity of global law. So I'm on a mission to unify it and systematize it through blockchain and technology and do kind of an end run around these 
existing structures and get to us to where we need to be so we can focus on the real things, you know, like building spaceships and curing cancer. So I, I'm on a... I'm on multiple missions from God. Beautiful mission and beautiful framing and where you explain that. So is that the ultimate goal with law is to have that global law, thanks to technology, thanks to blockchain, thanks to a smart contract where everyone would abide by the same rules to make an open market and a truly connected society? I'd or say that's one goal and one primary goal. There's not a goal more important than that. I don't know if that's the only goal, but to move law to where it's global and computational and thereby predictable and consistent and you want something that's predictable, consistent and actually makes sense on its own virtues. I mean, you can have a predictable, consistent system that is gonna kill everyone. You don't yeah, want that, right? Yeah. You, want, you want something that's optimal given the things we're working with that you can know what it's gonna do and it's easy to use. And that doesn't mean one size fits all. I mean, you can have you know one situation where this sort of contract makes sense and the other kind of situation where this other kind of contract makes sense, but that can be discerned programmatically. You know, it doesn't need to be procedural programming where it's just one line follows another and then the results are foregone. It can take inputs and it can adjust based on those inputs. It can even have an AI component to it. In fact, I think we're going to end up with the AI judges at some point or oracles at some point, uh, and we should. But uh, yeah, there needs to be one unified system, and it can be like a buffet. Like that one unified system can be one unified buffet where you choose a little bit of this, choose a little bit of this, and choose a little bit of this depending on what you need. But that's, that's where we need to get. I mean, the, th think about the inefficiency which is generated by not knowing the result of a jury trial, right? It's crazy, that level of uncertainty. You should know what's right and what's wrong and what the judge or jury will, will decide so that you can adapt your behaviors accordingly. Because if you knew what they would decide in advance, which is possible with AI and with predictable systems, you would know what to do and what not to do. Or you'd know what risk to take and what risk not to take. And you can prevent other people from doing bad things by knowing what they will do under certain circumstances. And we need to get there, we need to get there fast. It's not the only thing that humanity needs to solve, it's just the, the issue that I'm specifically oriented and qualified to address. So yeah, as you can tell, I, I, get, I get jazzed up by this topic and that's why I travel around speaking about it. It's amazing and your talks are always so fascinating so like enthusiastic and i can feel the energy right yeah. now gordon like how excited you are about this project and you mentioned the dow it's you, you talked about how the dow is also a big part of your project and a lot of people actually think that the dow is probably could be the most innovative system across all blockchain technology simply because it can be an open company from the end to the inside to the, to the beginnings to the, to the end but uh tell us a little bit more about the dao like well what is what is it that you like about it what are you what are you so, researching these look I, I don't want to overstate it it's one exciting development amongst many it's just one that i have an, a particular affinity for yeah. so the idea of a distributed autonomous organization or in some cases a dac distributed autonomous company, company yeah uh, just depending on your orientation that's been around for a while now i think dan larimer or his dad brought it up and he's not the only one. Yeah. Uh, it's been kind of floating around there for a while. Um, Vitalik wrote a series of articles about DAOs and this idea. Um, and David Johnson, the guy who came up with the idea of ADAPT, distributed application, uh, put forth this idea of this blockchain-based entity that by creating, by minting its own token, develops its own economy and therefore moves beyond traditional company law. I think, I mean, it's, it's, that, it's that thing I mentioned before, which is, Company law is either, there's a diversity of forms, there's a diversity of jurisdictions. Sometimes there's like an overwhelming amount of jurisdictions like in the United States, it's just freaking inefficient. And the governance of it is unclear, the laws that, you know, the way you sue it or be sued by it are unclear. It's just, it's just a boondoggle. And it's not necessarily that I wanna bring company law into blockchain and just port it over one for one there's new opportunities that arise with new technologies and we can expand on the idea of a company and make it something more, more than what it was. Whether it's an AI management st structure, whether it's computers hiring humans and not the other way around, uh, whether it's the idea that you can merge DAOs and unmerge DAOs almost like you know, biological entities or you know, kind of cross their DNA if you like. I mean, they, they assume an almost biological characteristic in, in the sense that they can grow, adapt, take on characteristics, drop characteristics, all that other good stuff. And the, that's, that's gonna be very, you know, as life evolves so quickly and as commerce evolves so quickly, we, we want company forms, and I'm using a term in quotes, that can evolve quickly also. And code can evolve very quickly. It's hard for legal objects in our analog world to evolve quickly. So I think DAOs 
can really unleash humanity. I also think that they have, uh, you know, uh, people have mixed feelings about privacy and anonymity and whether your wealth should be your own or whether you need to disclose it and all this other stuff. I think DAOs potentially can allow people to engage in company style investments, not just crypto, but company style investments, yet maintain a degree of anonymity, which I personally find attractive. You know, I got a little crypto anarchist in my soul. You know, I, I got to balance. You know, I, I don't want I don't want terrorists blowing up things. You know, I don't want kitty porn out there. But I think in general, I'm, you know, maybe hard right libertarian. You know, but hard right libertarian. You know, with the kid. So you know, it's balanced out. Who knows? But um, I think DAOs are just an additional possible mechanism of liberty, and efficiency, and a way to promote ourselves forward to Mars and to space and everywhere everywhere we need to be. That sounds exactly right. You know, when I think about the evolution, like when Apple came up with this concept of people being able to participate at a product level, creating apps within their ecosystem, right? And then Airbnbs and, you know, all the companies that basically they offer the, the community and people to join at a product level, rent your own apartment mm -hmm. or, but it, it's not completely open, right? They cannot join the investments. There's still VCs behind back doors for privileged people. They cannot join the governance side of things, right? So it's really just on a product level. And I, I, I completely agree with you because the DAO, it's open from all levels, right? Whether it be investment all the way to the product. It, it can be. The, the good thing is you can decide. Yeah. You can, you can, I mean, it's just like any kind of blockchain network. You can say it's open and permissionless, or you can say it's closed and permissioned. You can, yeah. it can be anonymous, can be non-anonymous. The, the good thing is you can, you can bake your own cake every time. And unlike a, unlike a regular cake, you can rebake that cake when you see it's appropriate. So you're not setting it in stone once you've created it, unless you want to set it in stone, and maybe sometimes you do. Um, you know, sometimes you want to in the case of a charitable DAO, which there is potentially such a thing. You know, you don't want its mission necessarily changed. Yeah. It's interesting times, and it, like we may have discussed earlier, my, my wedge into this area was securities law. I mean, I'm sort of a securities law aficionado or nut or advocate or groupie, whatever you want to call it. And there's a lot of useful concepts in securities law, whether it's governance, whether it's cash flow, whether it's claim to assets, whether it's you know capital raising, the things you mentioned before that should be atomized out. You don't necessarily want to have it in a traditional stock. You don't want to necessarily have a traditional bond. You're gonna, you can adjust these things on an atomic level and democratize their access because it is Ridiculous that the most lucrative investments out there are only available to the people who already have money and, yeah. and qualify as an accredited <laughs> yeah. investor. Well, how do they get their money? Okay, it's like it's it's nuts. It's like you know, it's a weird patriarchal. Like, you know, actually, I don't have a mind. I don't have a problem with the patriarchy, but I have a problem with this system, uh, this, this sort of nanny state securities law environment. It's it's a little bit nuts, and I think DAOs and DAX can blow this world open and democratize access. I mean, there's, we're seeing it now, there's a lot of wealth creation going on. I don't know if it's wealth creation or if it's moving it out of the fiat bubble into the crypto world. I'm not quite sure. Maybe a lot of wealth transfer happening. Transfer. Who knows? It's hard to know. I mean, Bitcoin's not a productive asset per se. It's not like it has earnings and therefore it's becoming more valuable. It's more like it's a, it's a straw hole on the current sustainability of our fiat environment. And right now, you know, it's not looking good for fiat. It's not looking good for the home team. So I, I'm rambling a bit, but I, I think you understand where I'm yeah, coming absolutely, from. Absolutely, absolutely. And that kind of brings me to like you're saying, like these um, like assessment systems, or you know, in, in securities where you have the discounted cash flow, or you know, the, all the different ways of measuring, you know, the type of companies that, like you say, have productive earn revenue and stuff like that. Um, how, how does it work with crypto these days? Because as, as you know, like some crypto companies don't actually generate revenue. It's more of a network. Is it a security? Is it not a security? According to this jurisdiction, it is. It's, it's into that. It's like, tough. It's tough, right? It's really like a... It is. I mean, you know, if there's, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said. To, yeah. the, to the extent that token or platform produces profits and then distributes the profits as profits to the token holders, that's pretty clearly a security uh, under current law. Whether it should be or not, separate philosophical discussion, but it, it is a security. The, the, something paying dividends almost always is a security. Uh, that's a little rule of thumb. To the extent a token goes up in value because the utility of that token increases, that's an open question. If gold goes up in value because there's more uses for gold, that doesn't turn gold into a security. It might be an investment, but it's not necessarily a security. The idea of a security kind of involves a profit-making enterprise and the benefit to the holders of the tokens or the stocks, whatever, being because of, their, because of that profit. If, if the benefit is increased utility, 
like Ethereum comes out with a new platform and it's improved, or the gas costs drop, so Ethereum goes up in value. It didn't go up in value because Ethereum is making money. It went up in value because Ethereum got better, therefore you want to buy it more. It's just like, you know, you know it's a house and you, know, you add a pool. Well, of course, when you add the pool, it's worth more. That doesn't make it a security. So, but the, the, fact, the mere fact we're having this discussion and, you, you know, I get, I get asked again, and again, I get hired again and again to evaluate tokens and projects to determine whether or not the token will be a security. I, like, I want to work myself out of a job. I want to make it so that people don't need to hire me but it's computationally determinable whether or not something is a security, and then do we care? Maybe we shouldn't care. But it should be by math. So this reminds me of uh, our co-founder who was at Harvard Law School, and they had this Q&A about you know, value of coins and tokens. And one of the, the students, one of the law students, you know, raised his hand up, and he was like, yeah, but cryptocurrency has no value because it doesn't fit one of our evaluation models, you know, it doesn't work, fit the DCF or the DDC. And he asked back a question, he's like, is it Bitcoin that doesn't fit your models or is it that the model that should fit Bitcoin hasn't been created yet? Does that, does that resonate a little bit with you or? It resonates with me a lot. And I have a, I have a couple comments about that. The, it's, it's not that, you know, you could theoretically create a model that would make anything valuable, but, but that doesn't make it right. Um, the, I think people are applying the wrong paradigm here. People, you know, people are, like taking take intellectual property, right? It's just ideas. You know, how do you value an idea? Well, you, you value idea, you know, given its overall context. You know, the cash flow can generate, the, the amount of monopoly you have on it under IP law, the, whether it's defendable or not. The, you know, that, that's, a, that's sort of an esoteric thing that's not physical, that doesn't necessarily even produce a cash flow, but that you can value somehow. Yes, our, our models may need to be updated but the Bitcoin is designed to have value even in the absence of anything backend due to its scarcity and the ability to be you know, slowly emitted and its security against double spends and, and other issues here. It was designed to be the perfect currency. There's lots of Satoshi writings about, you know, you can make this perfect gray goo into money if it had these characteristics. Well, Bitcoin was designed to have those characteristics and other cryptos are also. But, you know, just, I'll, I'll even throw this out here, you know, People have this illusion that say, gold has intrinsic value. And my answer to that is really, if every human on the planet died, would gold have value? I mean, really, would anything have value? I mean, value is a collective narrative that we create that's useful. Right? And essential to life, right? It's essential to life. You know, and when I say it's a narrative or a collective fiction, I don't mean fiction in a derogatory sense. I mean, we live by collective fictions. Right? We, have, we have collective fictions about, you know, so many things like, you know, in some countries driving on the right or the left or what's normal or the way you start a conversation or what's aggressive, what's not aggressive. You know, there's all these fictions that are useful. Um, you know, like the kind of writing we do is completely arbitrary. It may have history, but it could easily have gone in a different direction. Right? The fact that gold, there's some things that make gold attractive, but it didn't have to have been gold. With Bitcoin specifically, you don't really need to value it. You just need to price it. And there's a difference between valuing something and pricing it. It, pricing it is what other people are willing to pay. It's the same for gold. Gold has no intrinsic value. If we all died, it wouldn't be worth anything. If aliens came to planet Earth, they wouldn't be like, oh, look at the gold. They'd be like, they would be like, oh, look at the ducks. Okay, as far as we know, like in some other culture, it's ducks that are valuable. Okay, who knows? You know, it, it was seashells here. Uh, you know, there's some probably some tribes that would have been like, here, take your gold. I want the seashells. I mean, you know, there's a famous story about an island in Manhattan being bought for a bunch of seashells and beads and stuff like that. So once you realize that Bitcoin is a market function and it, you, you just price it, you don't value it, everyone can kind of relax and just understand it's arbitrary but not random. Okay, it, it is a clear supply, demand, first mover, network functionality thing happening here. It's new, so it looks funny and it's hard to predict its price, but just because it's hard to predict its price doesn't mean that it won't have a price. And every time it's dropped, you know, I, I, I love this most recent rally. Like when it comes up on $60,000 and it crashes, they always thought that word, crashes down to 50. Like, give me some more of these crashes, please. You know, and I remember the last, you know, it crashed, you know, it's at 20 and then crashes. You know, it's like, I, I can see like Janet Yellen from the reserve and everyone yeah, else. Like, they're, they're, they're so ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, all you have to do is look at the chart of the dollar declining over time. And she says the Bitcoin's inefficient. I'm like, ha ha, ha ha. You know, it's like, oh my God, you know, you know, 
Yeah, meanwhile, she's taking her Goldman Sachs payoffs. <laughs> It's so funny because they, they don't talk about the pump that, you know, brought in more than 2.5x from his previous all-time high, but they talk about that 20% drop, right? It's it's funny how the media tries yeah, to... Basically, they're, they're trying to... Talk, I think some institutions at this point are trying to drop the price so they can buy quickly. <laughs> and I think that the government is scared and should be scared. They should be scared. This is not going well for fiat. And when you lose the ability to print money out of nothing, seniorage, uh, or seniorage, however you say it, you lose the ability to do a lot of things, like make war or simulated economy. If, if people had to pay for tanks and Bitcoin, no one would buy tanks. You know, we'd all have to like, you know, we're like, no, I don't want to spend my Bitcoin. Let's just be friends. Yeah. You know, but you know, when you can print unlimited dollars or euros or rubles or yuan, whatever it is, then you start, you know, getting your population enslaved. You know, you can start squeezing out private enterprise. You can start making wars that you couldn't make otherwise. I mean, there's a lot to be said for commerce and debt. I'm not anti-debt. You know, I think people who think that way don't quite understand history and how debt actually fueled capitalism and made everything great. But when you have currency based on debt to the extent we have it based on debt, it's, you're seeing what's, it's a mess. It's a mess. Yeah, a and now there's an alternative. You know, Bitcoin is a political statement. Bitcoin is free speech. It's free speech. It's political yeah. speech. It is, a, it is a speech by example. It's an object lesson in what you can and can't do with the currency and what works. I mean, if the if US dollar had kept the faith, there would be no Bitcoin. Right? Bitcoin emerged because the, the U.S. dollar did not keep the faith with its, with its implicit promise that it would not inflate too quickly. Beautifully put. Seriously, like it, it's just amazing how you just blended that all together. And and the senior age. Speaking of which, like if my grandma Susie, you, you mentioned senior age, which which is a really important thing that many people don't know about. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mind, like, if my grandma Susie was here in the room with us, how would you explain senior age to her? Sure. So, so right now we take it as a given, except for crypto people, we take it as a given that the only entity that can issue currency is a government. Okay, that's the, I'm gonna, I'm maybe you're mispronouncing it, it's a French word, seniorage, uh, okay. Um, it's related to the term fiat, which means I, you know, it shall be, or I say it, therefore it shall be. You know, a fiat command is almost like a dictatorial command, you know, or God saying, let there be light. You know, I, I, I wave my magic government wand and now this thing is, this piece of paper is now worth money. But that was not always the case. You know, the initial issuers of currency were banks, issued currency, um, you had the colonies in the United States issued currency, you, you know, individuals could in a form issue currency. The, and you would think, you know, we, for, you know, when we hear that, our current reaction is like, huh, that's weird. But then what are we doing now with crypto? We're issuing our own currencies. The, eventually the governments centralized onto themselves the exclusive right to issue currency. And at first, there wasn't too much complaining because they, issued, they had gold reserves or other valuable reserves and issued basically depository receipts for that gold. And you could, you know, if you look at an old US uh, silver dollar uh, depository receipt, you could go to the Federal Reserve and take out your silver dollar or the bank or whatever it was at that time. You know, it was freely exchangeable. Then they said, no, it's, we can't necessarily exchange it, but it's backed by, okay, sure. Then they just killed that in 33 and 73 under two separate situations. and. The, that's why the government gets so threatened when other people issue currency because, you know, people say Bitcoin's not backed anything. Okay, what's the dollar backed by? Well, the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. Really, if you look at the decline in the dollar value, I don't give them much faith and I don't give them much credit because they've done a horrible job. So this idea of, actually, if you want to get all religious, like, you know, you know, Christ got tempted by, you know, he was being teased, if you like, by the Pharisees and he was given by a coin. He said, you know, is, you know, should we donate to the Romans? Aren't they, you know, aren't they occupying Judea? And he looks at the coin and he goes, whose head is on the coin? And they said, Caesar's. And they said, give unto Caesar's that which is Caesar's, but give unto God that which is God. Okay, so Caesar is very jealous of Caesar's right to issue coins, but now there's, the monopoly has been broken and it's great. Fantastic. Hopefully that, would, hopefully that would inspire you. That was amazing. And you just went through like an entire century of events going by all the way back to, to Jesus and, and having this in such a fun, entertaining way. Gordon, you've been an amazing guest. Thank you so seriously. much. Seriously. And obviously, Crypto Mondays is also a YouTube channel that you have. So just to be super clear, Crypto Wednesdays. Crypto Wednesdays. No, 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 no. no. It's okay. Uh, no, no, okay, no, 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 no. It's all good because I'm associated with Crypto, crypto Mondays is a one also and it's great. It was started by James Half. Uh, Pedro Rivera, my friend, runs it now out of Puerto Rico, or at least the Puerto Rico branch of it. So I love them a lot. I didn't actually purposely emulate them, but kind of by accident I did. So it's a, it's a natural thing. So Crypto Wednesdays is my show. Um, I broadcast that with a friend of mine, Sander. Um, I have my own YouTube channel. We have a Crypto Wednesdays channel. I also do DLT Fridays. 
eventually I probably will have one show per day per, of the week. We'll see how it goes. Maybe two on Sundays, but who knows? Uh, you know, and, and, and he's walking away, but my, my role model in life is Tone Bays. <laughs> he's off camera. Stay there, stay there. But yeah, yeah, so I got the show. I'm a lawyer speaking around the world and just happy to be on yours. Thank you so much for educating the world and, and really being a, a great person on top of, you know, someone who's trying to help the community with moving the space forward and accelerating everything. And we'll put all the links below, guys, by the way, for you to watch Crypto Wednesdays, DLT Fridays yes. as well. And uh, Gordon is an amazing person. He's a great host as well. He hosts lots of uh, discussions as well. So check out his content for sure. If you like this interview, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and blast that bell notification to get access to more timeless interviews. Thank you so much. We love you. See you every Wednesday premiering at PC Near You, 8 o'clock GMT. See you next week, guys. Thanks, all.